okay, let's get started. Everybody knows I'm a bit of a stickler for time. Um, so people can jump in whenever. But um, I firstly just want to um, welcome you all and say happy BPD Awareness Week. Yay. Um, the 1st to the 7th of October is BPD Awareness Week here in Australia. Um, and I'm really thankful of the people who fought so very hard um, to have this day, this week um, recognised by our government um, and by organisations across Australia. Um, this year, we're focusing on uh, flipping the script and changing the narrative around BPD. So our awareness um, campaign has a two-pronged approach. The first prong is to... Um, target mental health professionals who we know are the leading causes of stigma and discrimination towards people with BPD. So we've got lots of resources to help them change their language and to move to strengths-based language um, as opposed to medicalized language. Um, and the second prong is to actually support people living with BPD themselves to change the way they, they think, feel and talk about themselves and to direct, uh, I guess, to attack what we kind of refer to as self-stigma, where someone internalizes the stigma and that becomes part of who they are. And so we really um, are hopeful in that we can start to change this um, and it will um, lead people on to earlier recovery, more sustainable recovery, um, and just a general overall, I guess, increase in well-being. Um, so I always say, Remember how, or think about how you talk about yourself because your head and your heart are listening. There's enough stigma out there. Do not bring it on to yourself. Um, be kind and gentle with yourselves. Uh, we're going to start with um, uh, talking about the reason why we're here. So we're here because um, there was lots of people, of course, who have been struggling over this time of dealing with a global pandemic. Um, and we thought that as people living with mental health issues are kind of the experts and the champions at the moment, and we're helping the world learn how to deal with what it is to experience um, mental health issues, we thought the best way to do that would be to get a group of um, advocates, of lived experience advocates from around the country to talk about what they have been doing specifically. And we've really tried to make it as... Um, I guess, diverse as possible because we know that different states are going through different things. They're at different stages when it comes to COVID-19. So I also just want to acknowledge that I'm here today on the lands of the Wangle people in the Yora and Darig nations. Um, and I want to um, welcome you um, and pay respects to whatever nation that you're sitting in, especially the Kulin Nation, which is where the Australian BPD Foundation who coordinates BPD Awareness Week is located. Um, so welcome to you from whatever nation you're in. And I also want to extend um, my welcome and my gratitude to other First Nations people who are here with us today. Let's get started. Let's hope that this video works. Hello, my name's Carissa and I live on Bolu land, which is Perth, WA. Um, I'm here to record a video for BPD Awareness Week in celebration of BPD and flipping the script. I think this year's theme is really valuable in terms of changing the narrative um, that people with BPD experience and turning that into a more positive light. So um, well done to everyone who has been involved in this campaign. Um, this year was pretty wild in terms of um, everyone experiencing a global pandemic. So um, I've been quite stable for the last three years in terms of navigating my BPD diagnosis. However, um, during the COVID crisis, a lot of things came back up for me. So today I'll share three healthy coping strategies and ways I was able to adapt during that pandemic and just ways that I've been growing and changing in terms of experiencing BPD anyway. Um, so the first tip I have is I really had to try new things. Um, 
And for me, my routine, I'm very sporty. So having a team sport was a huge social outlet for me. So when the pandemic first started, um, I felt my BPD symptoms rearing their head a little bit in terms of um, having that social network security taken away from me. So I started to do more individualised sports such as running, uh, boxing, um, swimming, just trying some new things, even though I did that anyway. But boxing, for example, was something that I didn't do uh, quite frequently. So that was adapted into my routine. Um, so, yeah, I just tried new things in the area that I was already strong in. So I really built on my strengths that way. Uh, the second thing I did was hone back in on my dialectical behavioural therapy skills. Um, I, I'm sure majority of the audience know what DBT is. However, DBT is made up of four modules, which is emotional regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, mindfulness and distress tolerance. Um, so revisiting my folder, DBT folder, really helped me um, and reminded me of how far I've come in my journey in terms of um, being able to cope and manage uh, distress. So I started to share my DBT skills um, every Sunday night on the internet so I could connect with people um, when we're in isolation as well, which really helped me uh, feel part of community still. Um, and I got some really good feedback with that. And then the third thing I did was I had to be honest with myself in terms of how I was feeling and being okay that I was feeling uh, dysregulated and those familiar feelings were coming back up for me in terms of um, experiencing BPD, um, which I think was a normal human response to what we were all going through. So... in different circumstances, so yeah. Um, I hope everyone has a really good BPD Awareness Week. Um, every day is a great day to raise awareness around BPD and definitely the positives and building on the strengths that we all have. Um, so yeah, and thank you for having me. See ya. I just wanted to discuss um, how I dealt with COVID-19 um, as a parent who has shared care arrangements with um, my ex-partner and our daughter, Violet, who's 11. Um, it wasn't easy um, during that period. I could sort of sense what was going to happen before it did um, in an odd way. I could see that there were a lot of restrictions that were placed on movement. Um, and then a whole debate about schools and whether schools should stay open or closed. And um, the federal government going, no, they should stay open, and then states being reluctant to follow that advice. But nevertheless, um, I could see it was happening that everything was shutting down. And as a parent, you inherently learn that, well, your role is to protect your children, you care for them, you want what's best for them. And... In an odd way, I could tell where this was going. So I decided to write an email to my ex-partner. I said, look, this is where I think things are going to be going. Um, I don't want to put Violet at risk, um, even just by going to pick her up and having her associate with other children and whatnot, that that places a risk. And it was quite hard to explain that to um, Violet. But I, I'd, I'd written this email out and I said, look, I'm just going to have to accept this. It's not going to be easy. Um, it's not for a second that I don't want to see Violet. Of course I do. But there's a, such an element of risk with the, the rate of transmission and how dangerous the virus is. Um, I just I couldn't, couldn't put her through that um, and I didn't want to put her through that. Now, there's, there may be some people who think I'm over-dramatising that and that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, but at the same time, it was my decision and it was my ex-partner's decision. Um, 
and it wasn't easy. I went through a whole range of emotional emotional issues with that um, because I'm so used to seeing my daughter and, and caring for her. And it really crushed me that it, um, I had to accept that in the first place. It's like, I didn't ask for this virus, why, why, why? And um, it got really angry. But um, I tried to cope through throwing myself into my work and my study. Um, music was a really big, important thing. I started learning um, David Bowie's Life on Mars on piano during this period. And I've gotten up to the chorus and I'm really happy with that because it's not an easy song to play by any means. But I showed Violet these things that I was doing and I was communicating with her and that was really important. I tried to keep open lines of communication with Violet as much as I could. Um, and the fact that me and my ex were, we were really amicable um, through this time and we, we did make it work. Um, I'm really proud of that because it wasn't easy to. I know um, I felt really angry, but I just imagine what, how other parents were feeling too. And this is what helped me get through as well, is realising I'm not the only one going through this. There are plenty of split families out there who have shared care arrangements who would have been affected by this. And trying to make a decision like this wasn't easy by any means. Um, it was really difficult and it really upset me because I love to see my daughter. I love spending time with her. I love to know how she's going, what she's doing. And most of that stuff I could replace through uh, email and phone calls and text messages and whatever. But you still need physical contact with the person. You still need to see them. You still need to hug them. You still need to speak with them. Um, but I just, I tried to do the best I could to cope emotionally. And it wasn't just parenting that was affected either. It was all forms of my life that were just thrown around. Um, and it was unpredictable. So things would change from one week to the next. Oh, restrictions are lifting this week. Oh, no, it might be next week. Oh, no, we got a new case. Throw it out the window. Constant state of change invoked a lot of fear into me and it just, it worried me um, that this virus was going to hang around forever. Now, oh, by no means am I saying it's totally eradicated, it's fine, but, and I consider us here in South Australia to be a bit more fortunate than other states and territories, but at the same time, I think everyone's doing the best they can to cope with this virus. It's, it's so um, random and hideous and a lot of the decisions that were made back then were just, they were on the basis of um, harm minimisation and, and prevention, if, if, if they could do it. So getting back to parenting, it was really traumatic as a parent, and just to deal with COVID yourself, but having to explain it to a, um, a small child, it, it was difficult. And then you're getting constant media bombardments of COVID this, COVID that, COVID, COVID, COVID. COVID. Sometimes I just wanted to scream, but you have to keep it together for your kids. And this is what I tried to do. I, I, tried, I tried my best. Um, and I like to think that Violet is still a happy child. I, do, I, I was really concerned about um, the schooling and just being removed from school and being home taught and stuff like that. But I'm hoping it hasn't done too much damage. Um, I don't think it has, but there's still ongoing concerns about COVID, especially in all the other states, but I, I try to remember that I've done my best and no amount of worrying or um, anger or frustration would have changed what was happening. So I just, I accepted it. So that was the main reason I, or main way I, I dealt with things. So thank you for watching. So I actually went into isolation in late February um, because I have underlying health issues. And so for me, not much changes with me in terms of what changes with the rest of the state. Um, I'm still, um, you know, kind of in the same isolation, even though I'm in New South Wales and we're not required to do that. So I knew that it was going to be a bit of a long haul for me. Um, and so, so I think some of the things that I did when I first went into isolation and made that decision, um, I really did make that decision and I use a lot of radical acceptance. So 
I kind of radically accepted that this would be my life for, you know, the next six months. And um, I just needed to accept that and kind of move on. And so I did grieve that a little bit. Like, I think one of the things that I did was I just felt my feelings and I allowed them to come and I allowed myself to grieve for the things that I was losing and for the pain that I was kind of feeling around that. But I just really kept myself strong in terms of understanding that I needed to radically accept it and that by radically accepting it, I could also radically accept that it will change and things will, um, you know, open up again and will be safe again. And so that's been really helpful. When I first went into isolation, routine was really important for me um, to kind of keep a routine going. I had a checklist of things that I would do during the day to make sure that my mental health was being taken care of. Um, I had to wait around about two months for my mental health professional, my psychologist, to actually um, get connected to telehealth services. And so that was um, a bit of a hard slog, but we did have some email contact, so that was good. Um, and once he did get online, we increased um, our sessions. We were only seeing each other previously, like every fortnight or every month. And we increased that for a period of time to once a week. And that was really helpful um, because there were days when I needed it because everything was changing so quickly on a daily basis that, um, you know, it wasn't any way like normal life. And so I needed that extra support. So I reached out to him and he was able to provide that for me. And that was really important for a period of time as well. Um, I also made sure that I had a few friends that I was checking in with every day, um, even just to be like, hey, how are you going? And they were checking on me. Um, you know, they were making sure that I had everything that I needed. Uh, they would go to the store for me. But they were really great as well in understanding my anxiety around the situation. So, you know, in order to kind of allow them to drop groceries or whatever and to be near my home, I kind of had a little bit of a protocol that I needed them to follow. And they actually all did that. And so they were unbelievably loving and kind about that and they never questioned it they were like if this is what you need to feel safe and this is what you need and that was really important another thing that was really important was these guys um so i have two cats and a dog who you can probably hear she's behind me there she is um and so my pets were a big stabilizer for me so on bad days, I would, you know, wake up and make sure that I fed them. I would make sure that my dog was taken outside, that my cats had what they need. <laughs> this is life. I also accepted that this would happen. Um, I accepted that, you know, my life was going to be within, you know, this, this apartment for a while. And I had to roll with that. So it meant that, you know, the cats and the dog came to therapy with me and they were in work meetings with me and they went to uni with me and I learned to cope with that and I learned to adjust to that and I guess kind of say to other people, you need to be okay with this because this is my life and I need these, you know, animals around me. And so they were really um, a big support for me in terms of as well as getting some contact um, definitely getting some love and affection um, because my friends haven't been allowed, been able to be around me um, due to my high level of risk. Um, and so that's been difficult. Um, but reaching out to others is definitely something that has been really important to me. Um, and one of the most positive things that has come out of this situation and one of the strategies that I definitely have used is to reach out to others. Um, and so I started an online DBT art group. I was always going to do it, um, but I was going to do it face to face and COVID got in the way of that and I wasn't able to do that. <laughs> and so I adjusted, um, I worked around it and I thought to myself, okay, can I do this online? How will I do this online? Um, and how would I reach to people? And we went from there being six of us, <laughs> a couple of people that I um, am a mentor to, um, or I'm, I quite know well and I wanted to support. And now the group has over 250 members 
and I've had to um, close the program and I have um, four programs, four groups that I run every week um, and I have an 18 week DBT arts program that I've created from scratch. Um, being with them every week, being seeing, you know, 45 people every week um, has been a really big plus. And there are people in that group that I would never have been able to make contact with had COVID not happened. So for me, being able to see the positives, um, reminding myself, you know, that, um, you know, everything will be all right. <laughs> is really important. There are positives that have come out of this and there's also horrible negatives and we can sit with them and we can feel the feelings around them as well. But for me, being able to reframe every day and think about the positives, remind myself how lucky I am um, to have the experience that I have. One of the great things about having mental health issues is that you know what it's like to survive and you have excellent survival skills. So people with mental health issues are the experts right now. We know how to monitor our mental health and we know that we have strategies in order to make our mental health better. So just be an expert. And if you can, get a very annoying pug who interrupts everything you do. <laughs> So the challenges I faced this year were looking at homeschooling um, in April, I think we started, um, and pulling our son out of school wasn't an easy decision to make, but it was one that we um, we really had to consider based on the fact that I live with a chronic health condition and we were really unsure um, as to the sort of implications of, um, of COVID hitting SA and um, me becoming unwell. So looking at the, um, the prospect of, of April and May and beyond um, being a homeschool um, teacher or facilitator really was not um, something I was sort of equipped for, uh, nor had the energy to do. So we kind of embraced it, um, my son and I, for the first few weeks um, and really set our bar quite high and unrealistically. We found, I think, by about week three, we kind of had really burnt out and I had certainly burnt a lot of um, energy trying to kind of keep up with school uh, with other friends who had kept their children home um, that the kind of perfectionistic um, tendencies that I can um, I can kind of leave unchecked sometimes if I'm not in a wise mind um, or um, really mindful of that so um, trying to do everything perfectly and be that perfect um, you know, mom and homeschool teacher was um, you know, pretty quick to fall away. <laughs> um, we, we got really real and decided to practice a lot of self-care um, just to manage those kind of daily um, struggles or emotions, um, the the symptoms of um, you know being housebound and being away from friends and not being able to see family. Um, they were definitely uh, things that we really needed to stay kind of on top of before they managed us. So we found creative ways to connect with friends, um, you know, via. Uh, phone calls and FaceTime and writing letters and writing over to friends who lived um, close by and sort of waving on the footpath and um, finding time to uh, really prioritise those, um, those needs, uh, the, the connection especially during that time. For me, I guess, um, embracing a real creative and 
creative way of life this year has been um, one of the one of the positives. I've really enjoyed uh, participating in online um, DBT art skills classes um, and finding time to kind of create art this year um, for my mental health and to find sort of joy in, in a pretty challenging year. We've also been able to embrace a slower kind of way of living this year. Um, my husband's always enjoyed gardening and we've grown a lot of plants, um, you know, raised seeds this year and had sort of tie-ins, sort of school projects where we have photographed, um, you know, seedlings growing and we hand raised some chicks and, um, you know, seeing them progress and our son being involved in that was something that we were lucky to, to you know, spend some time doing this year, being home, um, you know, a lot of the time. We, um, <clears throat> we also really enjoyed reading, reading aloud, and we read The Hobbit this year. And my son loved it, and that sent us sort of on a different um, fantasy book trail, which was um, which was really lovely. Um, I also have really embraced um, audio books and finding time to, if I'm not well enough, for traditional reading. Um, you know, finding the time to listen to a story while lying down or resting. Um, that's been one thing that I can't live without is that, you know, sometime in the day I need to have, have that time and that rest time and recharge time. I think too, being able to see a lot of the struggles that I faced for a long time be validated and to have mental health and, um, you know, uh, chronic illness or at least, um, you know, illness management on on people's kind of minds has been has been one thing that has encouraged me to embrace my situation um because people start sort of seeing you as um you know a little bit of a, a leader or um you know an experienced person um, given the struggles that you know this year has Kind of put on a lot of people that may um, may not have experienced um, you know chronic illness or um, mental health issues. So being able to um, you know be uh, a voice of of wisdom, I guess, or experience has been something that I've I've been really lucky to to embrace, and it's something that I think has encouraged me to speak up about um, mental health issues and um, become, I guess, more of my own advocate um, and really become my own champion um, by taking control or taking, um, you know, taking stock of my mental health. Um, so I really enjoy connecting with a lot of people. I might not have this year through... Um, through art classes and through, um, you know, those challenges of keeping really well um, during time that really has challenged a lot of people. I was diagnosed with COVID-19 earlier this year and despite my very long list of health issues, I actually made a full recovery. At the time I was living with my parents, which was quite scary, but we were wearing masks, practicing social distancing, sanitizing and disinfecting everything. And nobody in the household caught the virus. So it works. Practice social distancing, wear your masks and you'll be okay. Um, I know it's a really scary time right now. The whole world is kind of unsure and anxious. And I don't know, there's things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. So keep it up. Um, I guess one of the big things for surviving the lockdown personally was establishing a routine. Um, I was in total isolation. So I wasn't even allowed to leave my house to go for a walk 
or even to go to the shops, obviously, to get anything. So it was really difficult for me to ask for and receive help. I had to really push myself out of that independent comfort zone and actually accept help, which was really daunting. But I managed to do it. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. Um, it's one of the big things with routine for me personally was taking my phone charger and keeping it outside my bedroom. So overnight, my phone's charging outside my room and in the morning when my alarm goes off, I physically have to get up and get out of bed to turn it off. And that's been such a big help because once I'm physically up, you know, I can fight that urge to go back and snuggle up in bed, especially on rainy days like today or my dog who's snoring in the background. I apologise. <laughs> But yes, it's, I have to fight that urge, but I still, I get up, I'll have breakfast, I'll feed my dog, we'll go for a walk. But yeah, that's been really helpful because maintaining that physical exercise has been big for me. I have physical health issues that require me to keep physically active. Otherwise the pain becomes unbearable. So it was really hard when the gym had closed down. Um, and working out at home is just very difficult for me. But I did buy a push bike and I was riding that a bit before the gyms opened up again. So now they're open, I haven't really been on the bike for a while, <laughs> but the gyms are open, so it's good. And it's really, I don't know, I feel safe at the gym these days because people are actually following the rules and sanitizing and wiping down their equipment and practicing social distancing. So it's nice. It's a safe kind of environment for me. I push through that anxiety and actually get myself there. So it's all right. Um, another thing I guess was counselling. I was quite lucky to have accessed a counselling service before I went overseas. And obviously when I came back from overseas, I had coronavirus, but everything was locked down. So counselling services weren't operating anymore. Um, I was lucky to be engaged with a service that was offering phone counselling. Not really phone counselling, it was more just a check-in every now and then, but that was better than nothing. Um, a lot of people weren't fortunate enough to have that. And for those people, I would recommend definitely journaling. That was something that had been suggested to me for years and years, and I dismissed it and just couldn't sit down and write in a journal. Um, but I've noticed over the lockdown, I've been journaling and it's been so helpful to get the thoughts out of my head and onto paper. And even on days when I feel like I've got nothing to write down, because quite frankly, I'm not doing anything with my days, um, I'd notice that I'd be writing and I'd start to write and all of a sudden things were just flowing and flooding out of me and I'd end up with a whole page of stuff that I'd also notice I was processing as I was going and working through and solving the problems. So it's actually really beneficial to write down your feelings and write down, write about your day, things that have gone wrong, things that you've thought of. It's really interesting. It's good. Um, I guess my social life, which I didn't have much of a social life before COVID, socialising was something that I wanted to prioritise when I was in lockdown. Well, I guess we're still in lockdown, so I'm still prioritising. <laughs> but it's difficult, especially when you can't meet up face to face. But given that we have so much technology these days that allows us to communicate over distance, I guess we have Zoom, FaceTime, Facebook, Messenger, everything. You've got heaps of different ways to keep in contact with friends. But I had hosted a little Zoom party with me and two of my friends. And that was really nice. That got me through the really hard parts of my lockdown and my complete isolation when I had COVID. Um, yeah, I don't know, I guess self-care strategies, physical activity is obviously a big one for me, but sunshine and just opening up my windows and letting the sunshine in or the rain, opening up the windows and listening to the rain, that's been really good. Um, being in nature is really relaxing for me. And obviously when I was in lockdown, I couldn't go outside. So that was hard, but I did find I downloaded sound, like nature sounds and playlists, and I'd listen to them while I was reading. So that was really lovely and relaxing. Um, 
I also enrolled at university. So I don't know if I would have done that if COVID hadn't happened and the world wasn't locked down. So I think that's a good thing and I'm enjoying it. And that definitely keeps me busy lately. <laughs> uh, I also, though, I was engaging in all of the free webinars and workshops that have been on offer. I think that's one of the greatest things to come out of COVID, like COVID is there's so many free workshops, webinars, services online at the moment and definitely utilising them was beneficial. Keeping me busy, learning things, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, I guess avoiding the news was a big one. <laughs> For a while, when I moved into my apartment, I didn't actually have a TV. I didn't have a toaster. I was cooking toast in my oven. It was really difficult for me to access my belongings and get find people who were willing to help me move because obviously my COVID diagnosis, people were a bit scared of me. Understandably so, but I tested negative and I was healthy, so definitely not contagious. But understandably, people were hesitant to be around me. And that was another thing that I had to overcome that was really stressful. Um, but yeah, I don't know, avoiding the news was probably the big thing that I don't like to engage in the negativity. It's good to stay in the loop with things, but only to a certain degree. There's just so much out there that's negative and fear mongering. And it was best for me to disengage from that. And it's been really helpful. But yeah, I think the biggest thing out of all of this was the distractions. and. We can keep ourselves busy, we can keep ourselves safe, and we can survive the lockdown. So, yeah, I guess that's all I really have to say, but take care, stay safe, and thanks for listening. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I want to know what's going on. Um, thanks, everybody, for that. Um, we're going to move into a bit of a live panel now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, no, I'm going to continue sharing my screen, but pass over to Rita, um, who's going to facilitate the question and answer section um, of our um, session. Um, Marley, do we have... Um, another? panelists presenting? Yeah, so um, Holly was, wasn't was able to make a video. So we'd really like to give Holly the opportunity to talk about their experience, um, especially as Holly is located in Metro Victoria right now with a lot of the rest of people who are in a pretty severe lockdown. <laughs> um, so Holly, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I don't think any of us thought we'd be where we are right now. I thought I certainly thought that this pandemic thing will sort itself out with a couple of months. We'll be back to normal. We are definitely not back to normal. <laughs> um, and at the start of the year, I was quite angry. This wasn't the year that it, I was, it was meant to be. I finished university at the end of last year. I was supposed to be starting a new grad role as a physio. All these different things were supposed to line up, but the pandemic hit. And so that made it really quite difficult. Um, and like Carissa was saying, a lot of my coping strategies were around sport and um, physical activity and recreation. I, and that was all ripped out from underneath me pretty quickly. Um, it was one of the first things to go and we're still not back. Um, and so that was taken. And then so was going out and socialising with friends, which while I didn't do a lot of, I made sure that I caught up with a very a very like select group of friends that I'd keep up with regularly and meeting up with them became really, really hard. And then when stage four happened and we were limited outside to one hour a day um, and only one person with the shopping and things like that, I really had to balance the risk of me going outside and taking that hour and the risk to my mental health of not taking that hour. And so it was a real balance and because going outside is something that is really important to me, but I also have chronic health issues and was sort of like, is this safe for me? And in the end, I had to go with, I'm going to go stir crazy and absolutely just spontaneously combust if I don't go outside 
Um, and so I really had to learn to sit down and slow down and accept that this was not the year that I wanted and accept that I had to sit with things and not be on the run constantly. Um, and so I actually had to force myself to sit down and slow down, which ended up making me process and start to really feel things, which is destabilizing, but also stuff that I think I needed to over the course of, but I had never had the opportunity to because life got in the way. Whereas COVID sort of put a stop to that. So there's been that sort of able to deal with things while everything else is on pause, which has been sort of a positive or silver lining of a very, very, very dark time. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much, stage four sucks guys, but we're getting through there. <laughs> the other side is near. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. Um, and we're definitely, um, you know, here in solidarity with everybody still stuck in um, Victoria um, and in a stage four lockdown. And um, I think it's also important as well to acknowledge, I guess, like I did in my video, that there are millions of people in this country who live with chronic health issues. And whilst they might not be located in Victoria, we're still not going anywhere either. So you're definitely not alone, um, you know, and so it's really important to um, remember that as well, um, that we're living the exact same way that you are right now. So we're with you. Um, <laughs> There's actually been quite a few com people coming through in the chat saying that they live in Melbourne as well. So lots of people, I think, are resonating well, with your experience. <laughs> Um, we want to open up for questions now. So if anybody's got a question that they would like to um, ask any of us here. Well, um, Marley, before you start, I'd like to introduce, uh, we, we have a, if someone feels a little bit distressed, we do have um, some support people that are in on the meeting. So if you would like to send me, uh, Rita, a private chat, I'll um, put you and Joe then into a breakout room and Joe will be able to support you. So alternatively, try some of your, your own distress tolerance skills, but Joe is available and happy to support to anyone who feels that they would need a little bit of extra support. Give us a wave, Joe. Nodding in agreement here. I'm Joe. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Okay, does anybody have any questions for us? You can either un unmute your microphones or post them via the chat box. I guess that I'd like to start the ball rolling a little bit. Um, a number of you mentioned how you've managed to connect with friends, etc., on online. I'm just wondering how you manage with what I call Zoom fatigue. And, and getting a, a good balance between um, screen time and non-screen time. Um, Marley, I know you spend a lot of time on the, on the screen, so I would say that you've got some strategies there. Yeah, so I spend a majority of my life on Zoom. So, um, you know, not only do I run all my groups online, so that's that in of itself, that's um, eight hours a week um, of constant face to face. I then have three supervisors as well. So I have a therapist, have a clinical supervisor and a peer supervisor in regards to those. So that's another three hours. So add that on. I'm also doing a master's degree. That's five hours a week online. So and my job is um, I'm a graphic designer. <laughs> So I am permanently attached to my screen. I feel like I'm lucky because I've been using Zoom for around five years um, and the majority of my client consult um, has been done over Zoom. So this is not different to me. Um, the strategies that I have, a bit like Tia was mentioning, I never take my computer into my bedroom. So my computer lives here in um, my living room and um, it never comes into that space with me. Um, it's not allowed in that space. Um, so I think as well, I change my location a lot. Um, so I don't have a lot of access to outside. 
uh, because I live in a communal building. But every now and then I'll get a little bit brave and I'll go and sit in our back garden with my laptop um, and, and kind of do that, I guess. But I think I'm now just really aware of the fact that I've been staring at a screen for a long time. Um, and so I do things like I give myself breaks and I, I do a lot of, um, this sounds weird, I guess, but I lay in the dark a lot. <laughs> so if I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, I'll go into my bedroom and I have block out curtains because I don't sleep during normal hours like other people. Um, I sleep during the day. Um, and so I will shut the curtains and just lay. And even if I can't have like a nap, I'll just lay really quietly um, in the dark. And I find that really helpful. But I feel like I'm lucky because it really doesn't affect me, I don't think, as much as it affects other people because I've just become so used to it. Um, but, yeah, I think I think for me I'm just really used to it. So it, I, I hear so many people saying that they're Zoom fatigued um, and I guess I my body has just adapted to it, which is probably terrible, but it is what it is. Yeah, so that's my answer. Um, Anyone else have any strategies yeah. that probably more effective than me um, or just like how I do it. Um, Carissa, um, do, you, do you spend a lot of time on the computer? I, I know that you've done a, a lot of recording for your um, support type activities. Um, I think when it first started, I, I didn't spend much time because I allocated a, a specific day to go on Zoom. Um, so that was my strategy, just to break up during the week and separate because um, I work full time as a peer worker as well. So I didn't want to be um, on Zoom too, Zoom too much outside of work hours because that's my boundary for me. Um, so, again, I think what Marley said is just having that self-awareness to know what your boundaries are and your um, limits are. So I was able to set myself up and keep myself safe. Um, and because I am in Borloo, which is Perth, WA, we eased our restrictions a little bit earlier to everyone else. So, again, I was able to kind of swing back into my normal routine, which I'm very um, privileged and grateful for. But, again, yeah, my strategy and coping looked a little bit different, I think, to others on here. Okay. So thanks, Holly. Holly's made a comment that she gets bored sitting in front of the screen and um, fits in walks between every meeting, if it, even if it's just walking around the house a few times. And I think that that's a, a great option too. Um, there's a question here. Uh, I might pose it to you, Erin. It's a question about how can we support our students who have BPD? So um, educators are engaging with students online. How can they support their students? I can talk to this not so much as an educator, but my partner is a university tutor and has noticed that there has been a big increase in needing to engage with their psychological health um, than there would be in a normal semester. Um, and I've really noticed that she's been having a lot more meetings with students. Students have been having more and more, she's been granting so many more extensions because of unprecedented times and unprecedented circumstances. And I think it's all, I think for her, she said to me that it's all, it's sort of looking at we're in a really, weird time right now and understanding that everyone's having a struggle and online learning is very different mm. um, and adapting to that um, which is hard when you when some people are when some teachers are less competent at zoom um, and all that but it's been a lot of it's taken a lot of work and she's had a lot of support and she's supporting a lot of other people so I think it's very much be mindful that everyone is in that situation. Mm. So this person is particularly asking about the students that, that have shut down. Do you have any strategies around that those students that aren't really engaging any line online? I guess um, be kind to them. Uh, that's the main thing. I mean, I was studying at university um, in class before, just before it transitioned. Um, into online learning and um, 
he was all of a sudden and it wasn't expected. Um, I, I think by the university, the way it was going to go. So you do have a lot of students asking for extensions and it was important to support students in that capacity. Um, I, I found my lecturer was really receptive to um, me not attending um, because I probably decided not to attend a bit earlier than the actual university stopped student attending. Um, but he was very supportive of that. And I think that was really important, not just for my health, but to ensure I could continue on with the topic. And I ended up doing really well with that topic, but that was because of the support from the lecturer and his attitude. It wasn't punitive. Um, and he understood that um, because of COVID and the way everything had evolved, um, it presented difficult challenges for everyone, um, not just the students, but he himself, our, our, our lecturer. And it was important to support each other, I think. And, and he always would um, keep in touch with the students. So just to ask how they were going, he could see that students may, be, may not do the readings online because somehow they've got access to seeing who can access what. Um, and he could tell when people were probably struggling a bit and checked, continually checked in with those students. So that was really a, a great way um, for students to feel supported um, during this difficult time with COVID. Um, but I, I think the, the, the main way to support students is just by being there for them, show them that you care, show them that you're interested in them. Um, that way, if anything does arise, they, they're more likely to have a chat if they're struggling or um, you'd hope that they wouldn't pull out of a course or a topic or, or, or drop a day at school or whatever, whatever sort of scenario you're in. But it's just general support, I think, is important. I think also looking at what your university can do. So we were told pretty early on, you're, got, you're not going to graduate. We were, we were supposed to graduate this year, um, but because we have to do 760 hours of clinical placement um, as an art therapist, um, and that needs to be done face-to-face -face because our regulating body just isn't able to move fast enough um, into the world of technology, um, we were told pretty early and we kind of just had to learn to accept that. And I think that that was beneficial to do. So we, I think we were informed of that in May. Um, and it was beneficial because there was lots of people who, if they hadn't, if they had to wait and they, you know, expected it, expected it, expected it, that would have been harder for them. Um, a lot of people were also then at that point, they, um, they lifted the um, census date so you could drop a subject without having to pay for it through HECS. Um, now that's at master's level. I'm not sure if they, they're doing that for undergrad. Um, and I think I also have a special consideration, um, which means I don't have to go to Zoom classes. Um, everything that we do also, they now record it. Um, but I found the Zoom class environment really invalidating because um, you know, dealing with and dealing with, I guess, vulnerable people um, and people's reaction to that becoming art therapists, they weren't really able to, I guess, monitor themselves very well. And the, the teachers often struggled to contain the group. Um, and it wasn't a it wasn't a positive environment for me. So I obtained a special consideration. And so now the sessions are recorded um, and a note taker is in those and both of those things are sent to me. So I don't actually have to physically go to class. I'm still learning um, with university study and especially postgraduate study. A lot of it is self-learning anyway. You get a reading list and you have to do that reading list. Um, and also having a really strong um, uh, advocate in my unit coordinator. Um, so her being able to be that person for me um, as well. So I think before you drop out or before you kind of say, oh no, I just can't do it, go to those people in charge and ask them because I had no idea that I could have gotten that special consideration um, until I asked my coordinator. And she was the one that said, hey, how about we do this instead of you, know, you just not turning up to class and not telling anybody about it. So I think it's really important to engage with the people that um, you know, are controlling these things and ask them questions and explain your situation Give them a chance, I guess, to, to try and make things better for you.
that's a really important point too, Marley, that you've raised is that a lot of universities, they have um, disability action type plans where you do get a bit more leniency and special consideration. Um, I've definitely got one. Um, and although I've never used it in like exam type scenarios, I do use it for assignment extensions when I just feel like I, I can't cope for whatever reason. And I can ask for extra time and all I have to do is submit that and no questions are asked. The extension is usually granted if it's reasonable. So that 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 helps me. But I would encourage um, students in particular to seek support through a counsellor um, within a university or school um, to see what they can tailor for that individual's needs. Um, I just also like to, I'm sure That's everyone's seen the really helpful comments that come have come through in, in the chat. I think there's some very interesting points there. I just might move on to the next question uh, from Charlotte, who's thanked everyone for sharing their stories. You've mentioned limited access to counselling or other supports. What's been helpful in this regard? And have you been able to reconnect with supports? Now, Marley spoke about her clinicians reconnecting with her. I'm just... Um, Sophie, have you got any experience that you're happy to share in, in this regard? Yeah, um, so I've been seeing a psychologist all year. I've, I feel like I've been in a really lucky situation that I've been able to keep seeing her face to face, which has helped for me. And it's also been a good reason to get out of the house, go for a walk, like I see my psychologist go for a walk to the beach, go home and then I'll be inside for however many days. But she has also offered, if needed, telehealth or Zoom appointments. But since she stayed open, I've decided to keep seeing her in person as I found that was helpful with me to get myself out of the house for a good reason, put some clothes on because I have been living in my pyjamas. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, and I did mention that Carissa was going to respond and I, I totally forgot. Over to you, Carissa. Thanks, Rita. That's all good. Um, I think um, during COVID and a shout out to all the mental health professionals that were at the front line, there was a huge focus on the psychologists, the nurses and the doctors being on the front line. However, as a peer worker and accessing community services, I think they were left out of the narrative. And I think that's what I saw a lot of people that I was working with um, in the community sector, that they were actually going to peer workers and support workers as their point of call during um, COVID. So I think it's um, relevant to mention that. Um, I think there was other alternatives that people were seeking in other paths, but the community support services and the peer workers were kind of filling in those gaps during COVID. So, yeah, that was just from what I experienced in WA. Yeah, I can also attest to that. The, one of the reasons why I'm super glad that I've never became a, a psychologist and I didn't go down that route was because I don't have to be beholden to what the APA decides that we need to do. So it's really important to also acknowledge, I think, as well, that it wasn't the psychologists themselves that made the decision to wait for that contact. They needed to wait for their regulating bodies to regulate that. They're a highly regulated service for a good reason, but same as Carissa, it was this great opportunity, right, for us to step in and say, if your psychologist can't see you, I'm awake until four o'clock in the morning. You wanna Zoom with me? Um, now, I don't work in a very structured way with, with my peer work. Um, I don't, I don't put time limits on the amount of time I spend with people. Um, we sit on Zoom for as long as that, peer, that person needs to sit on Zoom with me. Um, and we have the conversations that person needs to have with me. Um, and I'm lucky because, um, because I guess that the people that I, I am regulated by didn't really make a lot of those, no, you can't see them, no, you have to do this, you have to do it over, over this platform. They didn't have those rigid rules. Um, one of the things that I just want to mention about telehealth that I think it's important for psychologists and mental health professionals to know is that 
what I am hearing is that people are absolutely terrified you're going to take it away from us. There are many people who live with disability, not just mental health issues, but also physical disability. Having access to telehealth has mean that they can finally get the support they need. They can talk to a psychiatrist on the other side of the country who is a specialist in what they need. If you take that away, you're going to basically cut off a lifeline that they've created. So I'm all about really making sure that we have both options. You know, once it becomes safe to go back um, and see people face to face, and that will be different for everybody regarding of their situations, nobody should be forced to go back face to face. We also need to make sure that we keep that line of, um, of technology open for people, um, people in rural environments, um, people with, you know, disabilities or other access issues. Um, because I think it's important for us to both ha have both. And that's one of the great things about COVID is that people with disabilities are going, you told me it would never happen. You told me it couldn't happen. And yet when the world had to go uh, inside, you made it happen in 10 minutes. So don't take it away. So I think, you know, if there are any psychologists that are joining us today, I really encourage you to um, remind the APA that, that we exist and that we need support too. Um, and I think it should become something that is um, common and available going forward. Um, Holly, you, uh, do you, would you like to make a comment about that? Yeah, so I've actually been very much in a very similar um, position to Sophie in that I've had access to therapy via a num various in person via the phone on Zoom at various points of time in the year. And something that I find interesting is that my current psychologist, um, they did a switch halfway through this year, but um, is offering Zoom or in person, depending on what you need and what you want to do. And I found the in-person sessions are worth me going out. We, do it, we both do it masked, she has a face shield, it's socially distanced. And it's, I felt really safe that that environment was safe um, and I think that was really important because the person interaction that happens in a room versus via a screen is something that was quite important at that time particularly because we were building that therapeutic alliance um, I, but I think that there has been a lot of difficulty for a lot of people because of that waiting period of the APA stepping up um, can we do zoom how do we do it um, and all the regulations. And I think that that did cause a gap in my, for a little while, but overall, I found that most healthcare professionals have been willing and able to be flexible. And I think as a health professional, we're learning that as well, we're learning the ropes. We're not, we're still like, how does this work? Mm. <laughs> it's still very different, but I think it's starting to take form. For sure. And I guess that I might take this opportunity to do a bit of a plug. The foundation has um, developed a survey with Spectrum to find, uh, um, to try and explore people's experiences of telehealth who have got BPD. And we've heard some positive and some, some negative stories. And your, your feedback on that survey would be really appreciated. So, we might send it out with the, um, the the link to the feedback for tonight's session and feel free to forward it on to others that you might know that could contribute because that would be really appreciated. Um, we could, not really a, um, a question about sleep reverse. So having found um, a... I guess a, a life pattern that suits you for whatever reason. Um, the flexibility and in considering individual preferences is so important. That's right, Jo. Um, Nat um, has kept her DBT schools groups going online. Um, yeah, and some liked them and some didn't like them. Uh, can I ask yes. Matt a question? Sorry, Rita. Yeah, go ahead, Marley. Matt had a question. I'm just interested. How do you, um, how are you doing that? Like, does that mean you're splitting things in half? Like where, or does it mean that you're live Zooming 
the face of face group. Sorry, now. <laughs> Sorry, having trouble unmuting there. And Todd just brought Gina out just as you asked the question. <laughs> um, so what what I'm going to do now is, yes, yeah, some people, before COVID, I wouldn't have thought of doing it online because, you know, everyone raises up the issues and there's all this danger and stuff like that, I guess. Um, and so with Zoom, I guess it was from learning. So we were in, I think we had three weeks left of one term. So I started going, well, people can come or Zoom and we'll test it all out. Um, and then we've been for the last, for this year, we've been doing it via Zoom. Um, ask people for feedback on what they like. Some people really like Zoom. It made it easier for them to be there and come. Other people really, really missed having the contact. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to trial this term that people who want to come face-to-face -face can. And I'll also have, because um, all excitement, we're opening the first BPD centre in Canberra. Oh. It was a dream of mine. It happens to be in my converted garage, but, you know, <laughs> Microsoft started off in the garage. <laughs> so I'm having a TV put down there on the wall so actually into the same group meeting, there'll be some people face-to-face -face coming and we'll also have it on the TV screen so everyone can see those on Zoom, et cetera. And we'll see how that goes. Amazing. Sounds like, amazing, Nat. Yeah, the power it's, of peer groups, huh? In yeah. Yeah. psychological it. groups. Yeah. 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 Thanks so much, Nat. So, so I can so we can so we'll have some info from how we go with that as well. So the survey on the Zoom stuff, um, Rita, that would be good. I can send it out to my group. We'll do. And that how they've found it. Yeah, yeah. it would be good getting that information. Yeah, want, want to capture something because uh, I, I think it's going to be unhelpful if it's either or. And I see getting some form of combination because um, even though it can be extra convenient to just engage with a therapist online there is a part of for, for some people that are able of actually going getting out of your house and actually going to meet somebody um and i guess one of my concerns is that people might become a little bit more insular because they don't need to do that and i don't think that that's long-term helpful but hey this this is a a new space for all of us I just like to to put to the panel, and it's it's something that I put a fair bit of thought into, uh, and we're probably all going to be in different places. Um, a lot of people have experienced uh, expressed to me anxiety about when lockdown eases and actually going back to the way that our lives were before, if it ever goes back to 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 that, and it may may not for some time i'm just wondering how you manage that anxiety right um, now i'm like that's so far away i'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole okay <laughs> <laughs> it's just too far away <laughs> i'm feeling very much we're never going to get to covid normal <laughs> so i just sort of go we're taking this day as it comes and the next one and the next one, no point, there's no point me trying to plan for six months down the track when COVID is gone. I think we thought it was going to be gone by now. So, so Carissa, you'll be in WA, you've eased, eased out of lockdown a, a lot earlier than us. So what was your experiences around ex that anxiety? Um. For me personally, it was easy to adjust because, as Holly mentioned before, um, everything becomes quite still when you're in isolation, so you have a lot of more time to process. But because I live, lead quite a busy life, it was kind of easy to get back into the swing of things. Um, but what I've noticed in um, my peer community and in the workforce that I work in is that people are reluctant to actually engage again, um, even though the restrictions have eased. Um, again because of that anxiety that's around and I think 
it, people were traumatized. I think it was a trauma response to um, the pandemic as well. So in terms of that, I've seen a lot of um, people reluctant to still engage, even though we're in stage uh, five, I think we're going into where everything might be open in the next few weeks. Um, but I think being a healthcare worker and a peer worker, you still have to be vigilant and safe. Um, so I make sure that I'm still hygienic and um, making sure I stay on top of my health in that aspect because I don't want to um, impact anyone else in the community. So again, it was easy to go back into things because it was very fast paced, but it's always, uh, it's kind of become natural now to think about it um, as a second um, natural response, if that makes sense. Um, Sophie, um, you're from um, South Australia. I guess what's, what's your experiences? No, not from South Australia? Regional uh, South Wales. New, New South Wales. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I feel like it's been kind of weird here. Like everything kind of stayed open for a bit and then things started closing down and, as I said, I'd go see my psychologist and the streets were strangely empty, which was weird and... Then everything just opened up one day. I had a specialist appointment and I think I was more anxious about that than everything reopening. And then I guess the whole second wave in Melbourne happened and must have become compulsory in certain places and I do go to group therapy as well, so masks are compulsory there, but once we're in the room, we sit every second chair and we don't have to wear masks while in group and we get our temperature checked every day, like pubs are open, but you have to sit at the table unless if you go into the bar or the bathroom, but you've got to check in. Some pubs are checking temperatures as well. You have to make bookings. So it's like everything's opened up, but it's also in a very different way. Like, yeah, life has definitely become different. Sure. I think for me as well, like living in Metro Sydney, I'm six kilometres from the centre of the city and we still have quite a high rate of community transmission here, but our government doesn't seem to be that worried about that. So it's been strange because the area that I'm in specifically as well, people are refusing to wear masks on public transport. People are refusing to wear masks going into grocery stores. Um, you don't see people wearing masks here. And I'm, like I said, metropolitan Sydney where the biggest outbreak had occurred in New South Wales. Um, and we're still getting cases every day. We're nowhere near zero. And so it's been difficult for me as somebody with chronic illness, I feel um, really disrespected, honestly. And like my, my health doesn't matter. Um, and that's been really difficult for me. So I've made that decision not to go out. Um, also, as somebody who has a previous lived experience of agoraphobia, which is the fear of being outside, um, I went through some pretty extreme um, exposure therapy for that uh, a couple of years ago. I've had to be so mindful to manage that. I started to notice that my reaction towards people was to step back. And that's not the, hu the human that I am. I'm very much, if you know me, I'm the human that steps forward. I hug people that I don't even know <laughs> as like a form of hello. That's just who I am. And so I've just been really mindful and also talking to my, my um, mental health professionals as well about noticing that shift in me, about feeling that fear when it comes to um, other people. I still don't, I only let one of my friends in my home. Um, and the only reason that she's allowed in my home is because she receives a COVID test every week because of her employment. Um, and so she always has to take a test negative. And even so, I won't go near her. So she has to sit on the other side of the room. She has to wear a mask the entire time she's in my home. Um, and so I think it's funny because 
I've definitely noticed that the people around me are now starting to, um, I don't know, not be as supportive of me. And they think that I'm, you know, being over dramatic and everything like this. But, you know, I have a really extensive and, and serious health background um, and I cannot afford to get COVID. So for me, I don't think I'm going to be okay to go back out until we hit zero transmission here um, for a, an entire um, cycle, which I believe is around three weeks. Um, and as someone who normally works face-to-face -face with people, um, I probably won't actually go back to doing face-to-face -face work um, until we're at sustained eradication um, or there is a vaccine because I just simply can't risk it. You know, to me, it's not a joke and, and I can't risk it at all. So um, it's, a, it's a thing. I'm definitely scared about it. I'm definitely scared about it. I'm scared about what I see. Um, I'm lucky I've got a car so I can drive through. <laughs> I literally just drive through the city with everything locked up in my little box. Um, and the only time I go out is to see doctors or specialists. That's the only appointments that I go out for. And, um, and, you know, I think it's important to understand as well, like not everything is open. So when I hear people, like, especially in Sydney say that things are open, they might not realize that immunology clinics are still not open. So the services that service people with immune conditions are still closed. For example, my specialist dermatologist, who is a immunologist dermatologist, is still closed because she cannot provide a safe environment because she knows that if we were just to get a cold, it could really severe our health, severely impact our health. So I feel like we're often living in a little bit of a different space because we're accessing services that other people might not realize. My neurologist as well also still not doing face-to-face -face. Um, and trying to Zoom with a almost 80 year old man who's hilarious, um, love him to death. But so there are lots of services that haven't gone back to normal and they've been really cautious. And to be absolutely honest, I'm thankful for that caution because they're, they make me feel like I'm not overreacting, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they let me know that they also don't think it's safe. Um, and so I think what I do as well, what I've always done is that instead of looking towards the government or instead of looking towards, you know, the Publicans Association of Australia, who of course want all pubs open, I listen to the chief medical officers. That's who I listen to. They're the experts. And it's important for me to only get my information from those people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I manage, I guess, that risk and that fear. I wait for them to tell me that it's safe for me to go out, um, you know, but yeah. Just speaking up for the chronically immunocompromised, um, of which there are many of us. <laughs> it's also sounding yep. to me, Marley, that it's, it's extremely important that your point of view is accepted and validated. And people yeah. are prepared to work within that. Yeah, everybody needs, you can't, and we know this. And, and of course, you know, therapists and psychologists, they know this. You can't push somebody into something like that. Like Carissa said, they've been traumatised. All you'll do is you'll push them further into their trauma. Mm. So you've got to be really gentle and you've got to be kind with people and listen to their thoughts. You know, of course, lots of checking the facts, of course, as well, um, you know, and, and doing that kind of stuff. But, you know, if someone says, you know, I'm not ready yet, that also needs to be honoured, you know, and then the conversation has to turn to what will make you ready. Mm. I, imagine if psychologists, by the way, could come to us. I'd happily let my psychologist sit outside my door if he wanted to come and chat. <laughs> um, maybe I'll ask him that. You know what I mean? But so that's that's interesting because, you know, once again, I think also it's a little bit about that power dynamic of what we have to come to them. My, my psychologist is located in a doctor's surgery, for example. Yeah. That's even higher risk. Um, you know, and so, you know, I think I would love to see therapists or any mental health professional become a little bit more flexible themselves and maybe start, you know, going to places that feel safe for the people that they're working with. Um, I'm not sure how the APA feel about that. <laughs> Probably Molly, <not>. Molly <laughs> makes a really good point, though, in terms of power dynamics during COVID is that the community support workers and peer workers were told to go to people's houses, but the psychologists and other clinicians and mental health professionals got the option of telehealth. Yeah. So again, it just really shows um, the power dynamics during that time as well. 
Yeah, I find it quite interesting because like even physio, I'm, I'm a physiotherapist, um, even physio has gone to telehealth and everything. And well, the option of telehealth, some people obviously can't do telehealth with physio, but there's the option of going to telehealth. So why isn't, and there are also options for people, physios to go to people's houses. So why is this something that the psychologists can't do mm-hmm. when other allied health professionals with a much more objectively hands-on role have managed to adapt to that sort of mm-hmm. that sort of environment? I guess it's a good opportunity for people to, you know, I, I have a psychologist and I, I believe in psychology, obviously, but also it might be a, a time for people to also have get another relationship on their side, you know, so not just having your telehealth or your phone consult with your psychologist per week, but maybe see if, there, if there's a peer worker, if there's an occupational therapist, if there's a mental health nurse um that that does things in a different way and maybe can you know come to your home or meet you in a place that's a little bit more um safe like a park you know like that would be a safe place because it's there's air everywhere right um and so it's I've found as well that you know most of the people that I work with have never had the experience of even meeting a peer worker before um and I'm still encouraging them to do all the things that they would normally do but um at this point you know they've they've got me as well for two hours a week you know to to be with them and support them in a different way and I think it's really starting to change the way that people look at who can support them um, and the different types of support that are out there as well you know um, get a team around you the more people supporting you the better I think yeah Marley I was going to interject very quickly I know we're talking about peer support but for me I know that that ringing my GP was really helpful and just saying like, Hey, you know, I can't come in or it's going to be really risky for me to come in. Is it possible for us to do telehealth? And literally, I think it was that period when I was homeschooling and I had like eight weeks of my son being home and not being able to access, you know, my therapist and, and sort of getting out. Cause I, I'm obviously, you know, immunocompromised as well. So, um, I think I've rang my GP and just said like, look, I'm really struggling. I just need someone to talk to. I can't access my therapist. I can't, you know, go wherever. And she would ring me every week. And even though she, she's a GP, she's not a therapist, just being able to check in and have someone, you know, listen to what's going on, I think was a lifeline for me when things were pretty tricky. So that, I mean, that might be an option really for for some people. Um, Marley, I guess your your questions, uh, I was going to ask you and Carissa, but I know Carissa has to go soon. So if there's anyone that's listening in that may be interested in, in uh, embracing some peer work, I guess if you have some guidance about how they might be able to approach that. Um, Carissa? Uh, yes. Um, peer work for me was definitely a process and a big, long journey to get there. Um, but I would look up as many resources as you can nationally and also in your state. Um, in here in Borlu, which is Perth, we, um, Consumers of Mental Health WA, where I work now, actually offer a scholarship to um, study cert for, so it's government paid. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else on here has done peer work and what it looks like in different states and areas. Um, but again, there's a national peer work guidelines, I think, on the internet that you can have a look. Um, peer work's great in also um, still navigating your own journey. Even though I'm, I'm quite far in my journey, I still learn so much every day from all the different diverse, diversity of people that I work with um, in all walks in life. Um, so I'm very grateful and privileged to be able to work as a peer worker. Um, and peer work can look different to everyone. So like Marley does art peer work and it's just so flexible and there's so many avenues you can go down in terms of peer work so it's quite an exciting field to be in so yeah if you're ever considering it I'd just do some research online um, when you get a spare moment yeah peer work looks very different in every state Um, Western Australia is definitely a leader as is Victoria Um, in New South Wales our peer work is highly regulated to a medicalized model um, and not really that available outside that medicalized model. 
Um, Sophie did mention that Flourish um, is still closed. Um, it's important to kind of, I think as well, like every peer worker will be doing a different model of peer work. Um, I studied a very specific model of peer work. Um, and so, and that's not what they do at Flourish, for example, um, where Flourish are more using that, that state regulated process. Um, and so I guess I'm lucky because in a way, and I was talking a little about this in terms of my sleeping patterns, um, my peer work is geared towards actually being the person that's there when the services have closed, because that's what um, is needed. Um, and so it's highly likely that I um, will see people in the evening. Um, and that's when we talk. So, um, so I'm kind of like, I make myself available when their, their psychologist is closed, their doctor is closed, all of that. And the peer and the, and you know, the peer services have actually closed as well. So for me, that's really important. Um, and peer work can be done so differently um, in many ways. Like Chris has said, I do a lot of stuff via art um, and that, but um, in terms of getting in contact, I don't really know about New South Wales because there really isn't a lot of stuff here in New South Wales. Um, but in Victoria, it's, it's massive, it's growing, it's, it's, you know, they're opening new services all the time. Um, and so I would kind of, yeah, do what um, Chris was saying and get licked in with other peer workers and stuff. The University of Melbourne actually has its own peer researcher unit who write about peer work. So Google people's names like um, Kath Roper, uh, Verinda Eden, um, Kath Selleck, um, all of these people, they're actually working for the University of um, Melbourne and they are writing the national guidelines for peer work. Um, and so Google it, <laughs> um, read their stuff. A lot of their, the stuff that they are releasing, the, the work that they're releasing actually has a lot of services mentioned and featured in it. So that's kind of the way that um, you can get in contact with them, I think. I guess, um, Marley, thanks. So I would just like to add that uh, I think um, peer workers need to get um, adequate support adequate support network it can be a really tough gig and it can also be a really rewarding gig but you need to have that uh, external support for yourself yeah there's a big difference between someone just having lived experience and someone being a peer worker yeah um and Huge people need to know that as well yeah. peer workers are trained and they consent to what they do so a person just with lived experience might not have the skills and ability to be able to respond appropriately to what someone's telling them. And that can make that person then feel invalidated. And so it's really important that um, I'm a, as you know, I'm a big kind of like stickler for the rules a little bit. And I think all peer workers should be trained at a national level in, in all three different versions of peer support model, by the way, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that they have they have skills, just like a psychologist would go and get their DBT training, their ACT training, their schema training. You know, they would they would start to specialise. Peer workers should do the same as well. Um, but we need we need support from obviously our government to do that and to recognise us as as experts and as mental health professionals as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully this will continue to grow. And I think peer workers have. Um, become you know a bit of a lifeline to people during this um, and hopefully that will kind of move into becoming more available and more accessible for people. Um, Molly I'm, I'm uh, aware of the time. Um, Nat's written about Carlin's new research so maybe we could send a link out to that in the um, in the email. Um, but um, yeah, would, would you like to wrap up for tonight? Yeah, um, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for giving us their time, putting in all the effort to like make their videos. Um, we're currently working, and I literally mean currently as in our digital 
interface designer is currently um, pulling together um, a page on our website where all of this information and wisdom will be stored. Um, so if you go to our website and you look under lived experience, um, we're hoping that let's let's give him a bit of a break and say by tomorrow, there'll be a COVID page sitting under there um, and everybody's videos will be available. Um, for on that page, hopefully this recording will be, as well as not just that, people have contributed in writing, people have contributed by, via artworks about their survival skills and about all of that kind of stuff. So that's all going to be available um, on our website as well, which is bpdawarenessweek.com.au. Um, and as we go through this week, we're going to start seeing um, more lived experience stories being put up there. I've just finished 21 new stories um, have gone up there this year um, and so I just want to thank all of the people involved in that but especially our wonderful panelists as well for giving their time um, to this and and making space to do this video in what is a bit of a trying situation um, and coordinating that across five states as well um, so thank you so much guys for everything that you do and for um, being here and you know to use Sophie's word, being brave to come and do this um, and just giving back so much to our community. And I thank you for everything that you've done. And, and I would also like to, to thank all, all the advocates and especially Marley for actually um, pulling this all together. It's, it's Marley's brainchild. And um, look, I, I really feel that she's done a fantastic job. So thank you, Marley. And Marley is the graphic designer who um, in, ensures that that web page, to my mind, looks refreshing and easy to look at and has heaps of information and also designs the, the posters and the social media. So we're really indebted to you, Marley. And um, thank you to Holly and Sophie and Chloe and, and Aaron for the, the work that you're doing in this space as well, because that lived experience voice is, I think, how we really get changes to happen. Yeah, 100%. All righty. Well, thanks, everyone, for your attendance, and we'll get that um, feedback out to you as soon as possible. And there's some other events, uh, particularly if you've got a, a pet. Uh, we're having a, a pause. Um, <laughs> session where which is calling all pets to come to a zoom meeting don't know how that will go and uh tell how they're supporting their humans yeah, so please hopefully it's going to be an absolute nightmare it, it will because... be a bit, bit of a fun night with a, a serious message <laughs> i mean look at this face she's already grumpy and doesn't want to be part of it it's going to be great yeah please come and even if you don't if, sorry even if you you don't um have a pet owner then please feel free to come anyway um, and bring your giant Rottweiler, Joe. Oh, my God, I love it. <laughs> oh, my God. Look how beautiful he is. Just made my day, Joe. <laughs> Skyla could take him. Yeah. Um, yeah, so please feel free to come to that. We've got so many um, really great events. And, of course, as well, like if you are lucky enough to be in South Australia, Western Australia, or the ACT, they do have face-to-face -face events. So go meet Nat. Um, if you're in Canberra, go meet Nat at their family fun day um, because, yeah, um, you can meet her and she's an amazing human being and you guys get to go outside. Yay. And, <laughs> and on um, next Thursday, isn't it? No, next, next Friday, Aaron will be speaking at a um, South Australian event at Flinders University um, talking about the really oft-neglected um, situation for, for men who also have a diagnosis of BPD. Um, yes, yeah, so, so we're going to have a whole bunch of whole bunch of panelists, um, male yeah. contributors, uh, which will be good. So it should should be fantastic. It um, it's planned to be recorded and will be available later on our website for those that are unfortunate enough to get out. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Take yeah. care, everyone. Yeah. Bye.